On the phone, we have a legendary former coach at Arkansas. He was also a very successful AD there for, we're not going to say how many years, we're going to just say for many years. Frank Broyles, how you doing, coach? Well, I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm very happy to visit with you. I've had a charm life here at the University of Arkansas for 55 years. I see that you started at Georgia Tech as a quarterback. What made you go to Georgia Tech? Well, I grew up in Decatur, which is a suburb of Atlanta. I was a Bobby Dodd uh, idol. He was the backfield coach at Georgia Tech and a great All-American at Tennessee, and, and he was my hero, and I wanted to play for him, and I did. When you were a football player, was it ever in the back of your mind that someday after I'm finished playing, I want to be a coach, or did you, did you have other ambitions? No, I wanted, I wanted to play professional baseball. My my life dream was to be in uh, New York, Boston. I didn't like the Yankees. The Red Sox were my hero, and I wanted to play for Ted Williams' team and the Red Sox, but I hurt my shoulder uh, in uh, my senior year, and I went coaching and stayed coaching my whole life. Sounds similar to another Georgia guy, Charlie Trippy. He wanted to play professional baseball, too. Yeah, but he was University of Georgia. Right. He was a writer. Yeah, he was. Yes, he was. You're right. He was a hero of everybody. He was a sensational athlete and a wonderful person. Great asset to the sport and to the University of Georgia. Were you a, considered a passing quarterback in your day? Yes, I passed. I set the record in the Orange Bowl of passing, and it stayed there for uh, about 45 or 50 years. It was just broken a few years ago. I was in the single wing tailback in those days, but we were in a single wing tailback, and I, I went in service and came back, and Coach Dodd had taken over, and he was in T formation, so I was trying to be a Sid Lugman, a great Chicago Bear quarterback, top of him. <clears throat> what was the, the, the transformation from single wing to T quarterback? How difficult was that? Well, it was like... Uh, this, I was, as a single wing uh, tailback, I remember playing Duke in the mud, and all the players started laughing at all because uh, uh, they couldn't see a jersey, a number, or anything else on anybody. <laughs> but me and I was uh, tailback and, and all, and didn't get tackled too much, but safety man. But then I'm in T formation, we play Duke in the mud. Again, I don't have any mud on me. I was a quarterback and safety man. We beat them 14 to nothing. That Duke never got a ball carried to me, so I never got muddy, and I was never tackled as a passer, so I was the only player with no mud on his uniform. <laughs> How do you end up in the Orange Bowl, Gator Bowl, and Cotton Bowl Hall of Fames? Well, I don't know that, except that I've had a charm career uh, with some great coaches and, and programs, and uh, I've benefited from that. Now, you, you were drafted by the Chicago Bears. I was drafted by the Chicago Bears and the, um, let's see, in baseball, I was drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals. Was it your shoulder that kept you from playing professional football, too? Well, not really. It was the fact that uh, it was a factor, but the line coach at uh, at uh, Georgia Tech got the bail ahead job, and I bumped into him into the athletic office one day when he'd come back to pick up his family in January, and I said to him, I sure would like to be his freshman coach, and he called me outside where Coach Dodd of Georgia Tech couldn't hear me, and we got in the car and we rode off, and he offered me the backfield job and up my age to 25. I was 22 at the time. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Coach Dodd. I was Dodd. coaching veterans, the reason he did that. It, I was going to say that. Seven and yeah, the, a lot the, of veterans on the Baylor team. Yeah, I was going to say that the players that you're coaching were older than you. Uh, well, yes, there were. There was a, more than a dozen players that had uh, gone to the war and then came back and entered Baylor, you know, as a freshman at 22 years old. So, yes, they were much older than me and uh, – they kidding me about all the time, although I put my record in as 25. And so they, they kidding me and said, you're not 25. And I said, well, we'll just have to wait and see. 
you mentioned Coach Dodge at uh, Georgia Tech. Was he related to Raleigh Dodge, the former Steeler coach? No, no, no. Bobby Dodd grew up in Kingsport, Tennessee. Is a great high school uh, football and basketball player. Didn't play baseball in high school in those days. And uh, he went to Tennessee and and starred. And, and General Nealon, who was the head coach, kept him on as backfield coach. And he's one of the few coaches of all time that um, started right there in college. And he got the head job at Georgia Tech and stayed there until he died. Okay. So what made you leave Baylor as an assistant to go to Florida? The head coach went. I didn't have a job. Oh, that simplifies <laughs> Bob it. Bob Woodruff was the head coach, and he got the Florida head job. And uh, the Baylor people wanted to keep me in some way, but uh, I went with Woodruff, who I'd been with for three years, and I was there one year when Bobby Dodd hired me to come back to Georgia Tech as assistant coach. It says here that you sought the Northwestern job in 54. Did Eric Parsegan get that job instead? Yes. When you applied for the Northwestern job, did you think, you know, here I am 30 years old, they may think I'm too young? Or do you know? No, I thought I was too old. I thought <laughs> the game was passing me by. I was 29 years old, not a head coach yet. I didn't think I was going to make it. But you did, and you, you finally became yeah. a head coach at, at Missouri. Yeah, Missouri gave me my chance, and uh, I went up there and uh, enjoyed it very much and would have stayed there for a long time. Um, but then I got a chance to, to come south. Well, I tell you what, Missouri was a great job. I would have been happy to stay there. But I had dreamed about the Arkansas job since I'd come up there. Maybe I was repeating, but in 1948 at Baylor, we came to, to Fayetteville to to play the Razorbacks, and I saw the spirit in every store in town had a hog on it, and every car had a hog on it. And being from Georgia Tech, where it's a big city, and you got Georgia there and everything, it was something that I had dreamed of and thought, well, this is a great place, and I couldn't wait to get the opportunity, and I've been here 55 years. When you went to Arkansas, in the back of your mind, did you say, at, at some point I might like to end up at Georgia Tech, or did you say, this is where I hope Definitely to be? Not. Definitely not. Georgia Tech was an independent. That Bobby Dodd had taken them out of the Southeastern Conference. They were trying to be an independent Notre Dame, and it failed miserably. What was Arkansas's program like when you took it over? Well, it was. Uh, they had uh, won the championship uh, two years before uh, in the Southwest Conference, uh, and. Um, they had had a bad year. They were broke even the next year, and then I came in. What was it like uh, taking over Arkansas, and how easy or difficult was making Arkansas a perennial power? Well, I had uh, a great helper in Orville Henry, the sports editor of the morning paper, which circulated the entire state. And he was a big sports fan, and we became very close friends. And he built us a clientele of fans from one corner of the state to the other because the Gazette on the morning paper was sold in West Memphis and El Dorado and Texarkana and Fort Smith and Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so we were getting the coverage that we had not gotten. We were, the, we were only 35 miles from Missouri and Oklahoma. So we were right up here in the corner. And we were in the mountains, and it was hard to get here back in the old days. It was a four-hour drive from Little Rock because it was two-lane road all the way. So it was it was a change that we had to develop through, but we were able to do that by starting playing more games in Little Rock and building a stadium in Little Rock, and we built a statewide fan base that made us competitive. Was the biggest game in that championship season, 64, when you beat number one Texas? Oh, yes, we both were, uh, yes, very definitely. We had moved the game to for television purposes, and uh, we were able to, to pull it off. What was that rivalry like 
between Arkansas and Texas and you and well, uh, Daryl Royal? Uh, no different than everybody else in the Southwest Conference. Everybody hated Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were your arch rival because they had the, the big fan base, the big stadium. They had all the things going for them. So if you beat Texas, uh, you'd done something for the whole fan base. Well, and they all, Texas also had a pretty big recruiting area, too. And, you know, with football. Yeah, that's what I said. They had the whole state of Texas. Yeah, it, it, football's uh, like a religion was, there, too. There were six schools in the conference, and none of them compared in facilities and all to Texas. So they got first pick. But the thing is, there were about uh, 300 schools playing football in Texas, and so there were a lot of quarterbacks to choose from. Were you good friends with Daryl Royal, or did you view him as a competitor? Daryl and I were close friends and big competitors. We uh, we vacationed. We I guess we were the only two football coaches that played against each other and vacationed in the summer in Mexico. He had uh, Texas alumni who had a wonderful place in Mexico, and we our wives love Edith and Barbara, my wife and his wife. Loved to shop, and uh, they were called scratch shoppers, and uh, they would go and shop all day, and we'd play golf all day, and we'd stay down there about 10 days and then come home, and uh, our wives would shop all day long. I mean, all day. We'd play golf all day. Okay. So, so no, no handicaps involved there as far as the shopping? Oh, yeah. Right? We, well, we played the same. Interestingly, we were the same handicap. All the way through, and he didn't want any strokes from me, and I didn't want any from him. And we played even all through our 20-year career competing in golf. And then you guys played, I mean, you played a lot of games. What Was the biggest game besides that 64 game, that game of the century, the 69 game? Yes, because, it, uh, you know, they had uh, put at the end of, is that the one they put at the end of the season, I think? Right, and Richard and Nixon was play- at the game? Played it and he came to the game and all. It was uh, both of us were undefeated and it was after all the other games were over and we were on national TV and President Nixon came and uh, uh, we we were very honored and flattered by that. Well, and and that was a in a time when if you were on national TV you were uh, you were about the only game on national TV as opposed to nowadays where there may be. That's half correct. Di- we, were all, we were the only game. That's correct. I see they put AstroTurf in the stadium for that game. What was the reason for that? So that we wouldn't, uh, we have bad weather here and all, and the grass is gone. And um, so we we put the AstroTurf in there. So on, the, on that day in December, if it rained or snowed or whatever, we'd have a good turf to play the national championship game. We were the first school, if my memory is correct, to put AstroTurf in, permanent AstroTurf for the, for the field. Whose decision was that? Well, it was a long, uh, it was mine along with everybody else's uh, uh, TV. It all wanted it to happen. Everybody was pulling for it. It was it was a guarantee that we'd have a good game on national TV. It was the only game on that it was played after the season, you know. Right. Now, during, <clears throat> during your coaching tenure, you had a lot of assistants who went on to become head coaches. Uh, Barry Switzer, yes. Johnny Majors, Hayden Fry, Joe Gibbs, Jimmy Johnson, and others. C- can a head coach look at an assistant coach and, and spot who's going to be a head coach someday and who's not? Well, to some degree, but basically, the reason we had it, we were winning, and we had a winning tradition of coaches leaving, so they would get the job because of their association with us and the winning record that we had, and um, so that gave them a chance. Who do you think the best player you coached was? You know, people ask me the best uh, player, and I couldn't tell you in a minute because I, we have so many good ones, and, and I keep them all in mind as important. I couldn't come close to tell you who was the best. And I'm serious. Of course, it's been a long time. I'd have to go back and look and study it and, and try to analyze it, which would be hard to do. And you re- recruited a guy who's in the NFL Hall of Fame who played for the Bears for many years, Dan Hampton. 
Yes, he he was uh, one of the best we had, and and had a fabulous cold pro career, and is still a, a good friend of ours. Did many top Arkansas athletes get out of state and end up going elsewhere, or were you fairly successful at making sure none of nobody left the the state? Ninety ninety eight percent what that we wanted would stay in their state and play because of the family ties and transportation and all. Was there one that got away that you kind of said, how did they let that happen? Oh, I can't. Uh, somebody that's younger than me could probably remember, but I can't remember losing one <laughs> that that made all conference or anything after, after he left. Probably did, but I just can't remember it. You see, I'm uh, I'm going to be 90 years old before you know it. You're still young. Think of good still still. young. <laughs> I'm still young. I still don't have any aches and pains, and I can play 45, 54 holes a day in golf. If Daryl Royal was still with us, he probably could still coach Texas. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he could, for sure. His wife is just as young as... Uh, as you would imagine, she's in perfect health, and and uh, we have some meetings sometime at, uh, between the schools, and and we get to visit. Now, when you were My football, wife is deceased. Yeah. Now, when you yeah. were the football coach, you also became the athletic director. What, yes. What, what was it like handling both those jobs? It wasn't hard because I had a an assistant who had been here. Uh, as assistant athletic director, George Cole, and he did everything for me and just asked me a few questions, and that was it. <laughs> he ran it. Okay. Why did you get out of coaching? Well, I had uh, made up my mind I was going to retire before I was forced out. And uh, so I, I finished what I thought was a wonderful career. I had a chance to, to be the you know, continue to be just the athletic director here. And uh, so I took that and, and relaxed, and I've lived a lot longer, I believe, yeah. health-wise and all. I'm right. be 94, you know it. Well, you, you also uh, went into broadcasting college football on ABC Sports with Keith Jackson. Yes, I had a fabulous career doing that. It was a, it, it helped Lou Holtz, who took my place, well, I wasn't here to second guess him. I was gone every week doing games, and he would I'd come out and visit with him on Sunday, and he'd tell me what all happened, and I never looked at a film. Uh, after uh, I left, we just went on about our business, and I did TV, and they coached the team. Did you enjoy hiring coaches when you were the athletic director? Well, I guess that uh, yes and no when... When you hire a coach, it means that you've lost somebody or you're in bad shape. You, the only reason a coach would leave is that you're not winning. And so that makes it pretty tough to talk to the top guy to come in when your program is not at the top. They don't leave when they're at the top. As a rule, you're paying them good and they're winning and they got things going their way. Does it amaze you when you look at college football today and, and see that, it, that it's such a big business? Well, yes, we do. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's become a big asset to institutions. Uh, the football, as a rule, pays for the athletic department most of its expenses for men and women's sports. And we're proud that we were able to do that with the game of football television uh, I remember when they decided to put uh, television on national TV the first year before it started, we all said, it's going to ruin football. It's going to destroy football. Having a national game nationwide, it would compete with your game, but it didn't bother us at all. How did you end up hiring Lou Holtz as the coach? Well, I had known Lou as an assistant, and... Um, I just had great respect for him and talked him into coming. He uh, and he did a terrific job for us, and we've been friends ever since. I'm old enough to remember when football coaches made about 
as much as a college professor or, or maybe a, a, if they were lucky a little bit more nowadays coaches make, can make millions of dollars what what do you think of the salaries that they receive now well i i don't have any complaint about it because the fans are paying for it and um so if the athletic director of a school can go out and hustle the fans to contribute more money, they can pay the salaries that they need to to stay competitive. Coaching is a tough game, and I don't end it. I don't. Uh, I'm not uh, in disagreement with the money that they make. I don't know what they make, but um, they only have a few years in it, and, and then they have to save it to live on the rest of their life. A lot of. AD say they hired a lot of nuts as coach, but you hired a very successful nut in Houston. Yes, Houston was a close friend of mine. I had coached him, and um, he had uh, uh, I'd watched him through high school. I knew his family, and we were very proud to get him. He did a great job for us. Do you miss the days when there was a Southwest Conference and, uh, you know, there was a big eight? And there were long-standing conferences. Now, with with the turnover, uh, it's tough to know who's in the Southeastern Conference. You know, when I it's, when I was growing up, Missouri was change. in the big. It's a huge change in the fact that that uh, when we played in the Southwest Conference, Dallas and Houston uh, sports writers covered the conference like it was something else. You know, full page of all conference teams on that one page and all. But the coverage and all was there. But this way, we don't read anything about any of the other teams. We just, in our newspapers, they'll have a little short column about the conference, have a big column about us, and that's all we know. You not only built, you not only built up the football program, you built up that basketball program when you hired Nolan Richardson as the coach. Yes, uh, no question about it. Uh, he took us to the top. Our basketball program, our basketball arena seats 19,000. How well was, Arkansas. Yeah. How how well was was it received when you hired him? Well, <laughs> uh, the people in Arkansas, we had great coverage, and Jack Keedy of the Democrat and Alvin Henry of the Gazette, and they covered it. And they did a big thing, and the people were excited. And, and we had. We've been able to not play. We don't play any competition in the state, in any sport. And so the fans can support both the local college in their town, or it might be a university today, but there were colleges in those days, and us also. And that's the way we kept it, and we still keep it that way. We still don't play any competition in the state. Did you get any heat for hiring an African-American basketball coach? No, that was a big plus. No, uh, no, that was he, he brought a whole new game to us and all, and had great success. I'm sorry, yes, but we made that decision because we felt like we needed it to recruit. Do you still go to the office every day? Yes, I have an office. Uh, my secretary has been with me for nearly 40 years, and she's still here. I have a desk in an office, and she's next to me, and I tell people I work 11 to 1 with our all for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I, I had deferred comp, so I still am very fortunate in that uh, my deferred comp takes care of me until I'm 100. <laughs> I see that you're a member of Augusta National Golf Club. Do any of your uh, yeah. former assistant coaches or – Famous alumni like uh, Jerry Jones say, you know what, I want to go golfing at Augusta. I take all the people who want to go. I enjoy it. And they allow me to come about four times a year with guests. And so I usually work it out every year with somebody that really wants to go. What was Jerry Jones like as a football player? Any good? Yes, he was. We played We in his junior year. We went to... We kind of uh, got to where we could call time out and go out of bounds and went to platoon football. So he had been a linebacker, and he moved to offensive guard and started on an undefeated team and then a great team and uh, was a great asset as a leadership leadership to us. How did it feel when you were named 
the uh, 20th century's most influential Arkansas sports figure? Well, I've been here the longest, <laughs> and I'm the <laughs> oldest. <laughs> oh, it was a great honor because the Razorbacks, are the, we're, uh, we don't have any intrastate competition, and so we're at a, at a level competing against uh, LSU and, and Mississippi and Oklahoma and these schools and sports and all. Oh, and so we were able to, to be uh, accepted by both the fans of other schools and us. <laughs>